real quick as a oh, thank, thank you. you. Has everybody or anybody seen the piece in the in the headset or on Facebook 360 or around the interwebs? Cool, a couple of people. That's nice. The rest of you should go see it. Um, Chuck, do you want to start off and kind of talk about why this project came to be and, and why VR was such a good fit for Shinola? Yeah, sure. So I, I, I was not involved in the production, but if there's anything really great about it, I'm going to pretend like I was and claim it. So. Sorry, guys, uh, but I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to look at it really more from a brand perspective than anything. It's important to kind of step back a second and understand the brand of Shinola and what it was, you know, the vision of the company as, a, as it started. Um, and really, the, the company was started on the idea of being able to create something brand new in an area that a lot of people felt nothing new could be created, and that was Detroit. That's my layman's version of it. Um, and to be able to uh, uh, have the foresight to be able to create a company creating, uh, that manufactures watches and bikes to the most highly tuned and complex um, uh, items out there as far as products go in a part of the country known for cars. You know, people on lines that are you know, in Ford auto plants that have been shut down that are working on massive uh, cars. That's that juxtaposition of doing something so intricate and cool in an area that was on the decline was really what motivated. So, and, and, and why it was successful up in Detroit is because of the spirit of the people. You know, you have people that have gone through a really tough time in an area of the country that used to be the lifeblood of America. And, um, so with that, the idea that a company is built upon people that can come out of the you know come out of the ashes and do incredible work and create products that are made by people for people, it's what Shinola stands for. Again, my version of what the idea of Shinola is, and you see that even in watches that you buy, if you get a watch from Shinola, you actually have a little stamp on it with the name of the person that was involved in making that that watch. There's pride there, so. The intimacy of VR, the ability to emote empathy, mm -hmm. and the things that VR um, brings to uh, a content experience was perfectly suited for a company that was set with a vision like that. That's my mm -hmm. kind of big picture brand perspective, so. Yeah, that's awesome. And Andrew, do you want to talk a little bit about what it was like directing in 360 as a, you know some of the departures of what it's like to write for something that has a much more languid pace than a uh, traditional TV piece and uh, what you look for when you're directing something like this yeah thanks um, it, it was it was something that we hadn't we, we'd never done before and came came in kind of late um, so we were we learned a lot you know the learning curve was pretty steep and fast, and Celine really uh, helped us a tremendous. Uh, helped us. Uh, it was wouldn't have been able to do it with, without her and you. I I think uh, in a way we kind of Luke and I sort of represented the general audience. I mean I know people are you know 3D is something that's that's coming on fast and strong, but I think a lot of people still are sort of learning about it, and, and Luke and I are part of that group. Um, so we, we came at it with sort of a layman's outlook, which I don't know, maybe sort of helped. I mean, we kept it pretty simple. We didn't, you know, it's, it's, it's a factory tour after all. You know, <laughs> I think we were hired as sort of the class clowns um, <laughs> that try to kind of make, make it, you know, theoretically kind of funny. But um, yep. also sort of, but, but we took seriously what Chuck was talking about, sort of the, you know, the, the comeback of Detroit and how tough and resilient those people are. We wanted to sort of show them, not sort of, not kind of uh, so, so seriously maybe, just sort of show that they're still capable of having fun up there, even though they've been through some tough times. Um, from a technical aspect standpoint, we, I don't know, you know, just between us, I don't know that we really, <laughs> I think we just sort of scratched the surface. You know, we we didn't, we, I think there's so much more, you know, we could have done. We had a great time doing it. Um, 
and we learned a lot, but I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot more, you know, we could have done. Um, we did some things. I feel like we did, it was a two-day shoot, and after the first day, we kind of got together and we're like, man, we need to, we got to figure some stuff out to really <laughs> make this look like it's in 3D. Yeah. Um, so we did some things kind of the second day. I feel like that we're kind of maybe a little bit more interested. Push it a little more, Pushed yeah. Pushed it a little bit more again with you know with your all's help and uh, some of the other people that had a lot more experience than us. But it was a it really more than anything else was just a incredibly mind blowing in the sense that there's just so much you can do. Yeah. And it just really seems like the way of the future. I'm really glad that we got a chance. Um, yeah. To, to work in it, I feel like it's, you know, it's it's definitely uh, something I'd like to explore more. Yeah, from a uh, from a post guy's perspective, being on set, watching the way you and Luke would go back and review the takes right after we did it, and have a conversation about what's working, what's not working. Let's throw this away. Let's keep this. Let's augment this and uh, really hone in the performance as we went. I felt like that, that really showed in the quality of the performance we, uh, we got on film at the end of the day. Um, do you think that that's something that we need to uh, be able to do more of? Or do you think that, um, that going out with the system, just grabbing it and, uh, and seeing what you have in the can when you get to edit is gonna be okay? I, I think generally it's better to have a, a much more concrete plan. Um, we, we sort of decided, because it was all sort of happening fast, to kind of take the Letterman-esque man on the street interview <laughs> shortcut, which means, you know, no script and just kind of shoot all day long and try to get three funny minutes. Um, but I think, again, that's something that we were kind of talking about after we were done, you know, it's that things we wish we'd done kind of time. and. Um, it just seems like there's so many opportunities to do interesting things with a more kind of formal application. I mean, we were kind of running and gunning, but I'd, I think it would be, I'd love to see some people, hopefully us, do some, do some interesting things that are kind of maybe more structured. Yeah. I, I have a, just a point you brought out, which I think is pretty interesting. <clears throat> we were laughing in our panel earlier today about what constitutes expertise in this space. We all come with, exactly, we all come with a certain um, skill set in the worlds that we come from, right, in storytelling or whatever that is. But a resume of two years is pretty long in this business right now. So what's interesting and, and cool about that is, you know, even though you came into it fresh new and you had a crew around you that knew what they were doing, bringing in the subtleties of your experience outside of this, not having any predispositions, is how I think this space is gonna continue in advance. Is yeah. that once you get into um, a myopic area of, of expertise here, and, and nobody else from the outside is bringing in interesting and new ways to apply it. Right now, if there's any space that's doing this, it's VR. Uh, because every day we're learning not just new technologies, but we're learning different ways to approach content creation and ideas from each other. So. Yeah, totally. So sticking with the production, Celine, do you want to talk about, I, I think people probably noticed in the video, we use two different camera systems, why we use two different camera systems and uh, what they were each good at? Yeah, so that's the first, it's funny because as, as a DP and working in VR, uh, everybody always asks me, what's your favorite VR camera? Or what is the best VR camera? And there is really no answer. It really depends on the budget, the story. Do you want it 2D? Do you want it 3D? So um, at the time of the shoot, and actually still today, those were like kind of the best option for high-end VR, um, which are all very good, amazing cameras that are just specific. They're just best for certain specific situation. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with, familiar with those cameras. There is the jaunt one on top left. There is the dark corner Nokia Uso on the right. Um, GoPro rig on the bottom left. The jump Odyssey and the Facebook camera. So again, there's there's no bad or good camera. It just depends on the project. So on the Shinola That's not true. Piece, Some are bad. 
What? Some cameras are bad. <laughs> you may be. There's not <laughs> Some aren't as good as others. No. I'm sorry, right. that's better. Yeah. So the cameras that were picked for that project, we used the, so two cameras as you saw on the video. We saw the, we used the Nokia Ozone that you can see on the top left. Um, that is uh, a very good camera that has the un uniqueness of shooting 3D only in front of the camera, 2D behind the camera. Uh, and then for all the shots that we did outside, most specifically the rooftop, we used a GoPro rig that you can see on the bottom right. Um, it was really for me a way to optimize um, the, the cameras depending on the lighting conditions, especially outside, it was sunny day, so we had bright lights, deep shadows, and I knew I was going to get a better result with the GoPro rig. And everything that's inside and has a lot of proximity, especially with uh, the actor look, being close to the camera, talking to the camera all the time, I knew I was going to have better result with the, the OZO. Uh, so specifically, uh, the great thing about the OZO, I think that needs to be mentioned, is the fact that you can have a live preview of the camera on set. And that's one of the very rare setup that allows you to do that. And I think it was absolutely vital in, in this setting, having a director and an actor who's never done VR before to be able to see on set the shot. That's, that's very rare and it's very important. So as you can see on the photo, we had this DIT station they would live stitch the camera, and then we could look in the Oculus Rift live during the tech. And we could also look at um, uh, replay, right? We mm -hmm. could, yeah, we could replay the shot, if yep. I remember well. And I think that made a huge difference. I don't know, I don't know Andrew can probably yeah, talk more about yeah, that. Yeah, that made a huge difference. Yeah. Um, you know, just like video playback on, on regular Yeah, regular like just... Thing. You know, blocking the shots and yeah. then looking at it and say, oh, wait, maybe, maybe there is a better blocking for that shot. And just redoing the blocking, looking at the shot, etc. Yeah. until we were happy. Absolutely. And the, uh, the guy in the bottom right-hand corner there is actually the CEO of Shinola. That's Tom Lewan. So it certainly doesn't hurt to uh, be able to put a headset on the CEO and show him what he's getting. <laughs> yeah. Um, and one of the... Um, uh, another aspect of the shoot, we not only shot in VR, but we also shot in stereoscopic 3D. We did some macro shot of the watch in, in 3D. Let's see if I can load this, yeah. So what you can see is a very tiny mirror rig, 3D mirror rig, um, using a codex camera. And so trying to do those very tiny details of the making of the watch. And then I was, so I was very happy with those very cool macro shots in 3D. I was very excited. And then I watched the finished movie and they were not in the edit. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to know why. Uh, Taylor? Because <laughs> yeah. it didn't work. It didn't work in the context. It was a wonderful idea and it was perfectly executed, but it, uh, it took away from the story. Director's cut. I think and, that's a very interesting point. You know, just like, just like every other other medium at the end of the day you have to have a compelling story and you can have some amazing technology but if that technology isn't actively adding to the quality of the story then it needs to go and you've got to hone it down to the uh, to the seed of what's good there so they were beautiful shots you executed them perfectly but uh, they weren't part of the story yeah I think part of what the, the thinking was um, exactly what you were saying there was also the element that this thing was going to be, you know, maybe three minutes long, three mm -hmm. or four minutes, and thinking that a lot of the people were going to be seeing VR and having the headsets on for the first time and experiencing it for the first time to then have, to have that whole dimension looking at that and then all of a sudden to have them looking at a, a box inside the screen that they were looking at just seemed, even though it was cool, just seemed like a lot you know I had it was funny because we had people um, some like younger people like no sure no problem you just put the box right over there you could even put another box right over there it's no problem <laughs> just look at it but it just seemed like I feel like maybe just the geezer effect uh, <laughs> we just decided to try to keep it as simple as possible but there's no I don't think it would have been really wrong actually to put yeah. it in there especially the way you know, to, people are just used to looking at more stuff. I, I was kind of blown away just by the 3D, by the 360 aspect. So yeah. we decided to not put it in there, but I don't know that it was, I, I, it wouldn't have, 
I don't think it would have changed it. It could have easily enhanced it for some people. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I think the first cut we did was actually eight minutes long. Yeah. I mean, we, we had 15 <laughs> hours of footage or something. Yeah. <laughs> really? So, oh, it was a lot. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, it was a lot. And so, you know, and, and another part of that is when we got in there to finish it and we um, had Andrew in and going through the edit and being in the uh, headset, doing the edits, critical um, because when we lock a cut and, and go to finish it, we're lovingly stitching every single frame. So, um, you know, we talked a little bit about the tech of the shoot. So just to get into the tech of the post, um, we, we were using um, what was then a beta version of Nukes 360 VR tools. It's now called Cara VR. Um, phenomenally powerful, takes a phenomenal amount of time to render. Um, one of the things that, that we thankfully, uh, thank you Chuck, have access to is because there's a, uh, a full feature length animation studio that we're sharing a roof with. Um, and resources and partners and plans and creative directors. Um, we're able to use a feature length film's render farm to, uh, to run these, these shots through. It's a wonderful asset to, uh, to have when you're trying to turn something like this around. Um, so Chuck, one, one of the things that I really like about this project is the way it was rolled out. Um, you know, it, it, we talk a lot about how important it is for these projects to have a transmodal element to them, mm -hmm. to, to exist on a web platform and in a headset, mm -hmm. um, to exist uh, uh, across all of the different platforms. Do you want to talk about why that's so important and, uh, and how you think we can augment that in the future? Yeah, you know, I think um, it, 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 whether you're a brand, whether you're a film, whether you're, whatever, whatever it is that the story that you're telling, the touch points of how people are going to consume that are going to uh, vary from their access to whether it's cardboard or whether it's you know a different device. <clears throat> I call it my uh, blue hair to blue hair model, my blue hair niece and my blue hair grandma all consume things in a different way, but they're still looking. I can, you know it, whether it's cardboard or, or or if you're working in Vive or something, they're all looking at content and they're experiencing it in, in a different way. Uh, for us, the transmodal rollout was super important because you wanted to be able to have the idea of the content available to the masses in in a, in a variety of ways. Yeah, and that ensured, then that just that gained momentum as it rolled out. Yeah, totally. So, so this this was launched first on Facebook 360, Oculus, um, and Facebook partnered with us, and they wanted a. Uh, uh, um, a window of exclusivity for it. And then after that, we put it on Gear VR uh, in the Oculus headset running on a desktop. The way Shinola is showing it in their stores, and I really like the fact that they're showing it in the stores. Um, it all gets back to the idea. It's to connect the brand. Um, it, it's not about a slick marketing brand. It's about the people that are making the stuff, right? So they're putting the tour in their stores so people get a sense of who it is that's making their watches um, on Gear VRs and having that physical presence. So a web presence, a physical presence in VR, the most beautiful way to watch it is in 4K by 4K resolution on an Oculus. Um, I'm a resolution geek, so that makes me really happy. Andrew, anything you want to add before we go for questions? I think, I, uh, I think we got it covered. Cool. What do y'all want to know? Yeah. Um, for Celine, as a GP, what did you do with the lights? Where did you put them? How did you get rid of them? Well, very good <laughs> question. <laughs> no, there was there was no possibilities for me to light anything. Um, I don't know if I have photos of the facility, but this is a, like a beer warehouse. There was windows everywhere. Um, so luckily I was able to use all this daylight coming from the windows, but I also knew that with, especially working with those cameras, had a limited dynamic range. So uh, it's, it's kind of hard to see, but we, sh we closed the shade on every single window just so we wouldn't be completely overexposed outside. And then just using practical lights. So every single people who's working in the factory has a little, a little light and I literally switched them on all of them just to bring some that was that was just 
basically playing with practical lighting. Um, there's a couple of moments where we, yeah, like just using gaffer tape and just trying to do a couple of times, yeah, a couple of times actually we had to shoot plates and we replaced elements that were still in the frame. Um, I remember one day we had this horrible light right on top of the camera that was flaring the top of the camera. So we, we covered that light and then we removed the cover and just shot a plate for the top camera and we replaced it in post-production. There's also a couple of shots where we are in the frame. I remember when we were on the rooftop, Andrew was literally next to the camera. So because the GoPro rig doesn't have light preview, so we had to stand next to the camera and be as small as possible and shoot a plate and replace ourselves. Um, but yeah, in that case, no, no lighting. Oh, well, little, no, the camera is not moving at all during the, this piece. It's only static. So it was just, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you don't do plates. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're on a Moco rig. Yeah, motion control. That's the only way it's very expensive, though. Yes. Yeah, totally. So, you know, the first thing that we do is get back and run it through the auto stitch to get something quickly for editorial. And then um, when we came back and started, once we had an edit lock and started the real final fine tuning and painting out the rigs and painting out, you know, the, the lights that we had covered and the people who were standing in the shots and uh, stabilizing and on and on and on, um, that took several months. I think we spent almost three months in post um, you know part of the part of the issue that we had is we were shooting with the Ozo pretty early on so their their creator software wasn't quite as fully functioning as it is now um, and then one of the things goodness I'm so glad that they updated this that they have batch rendering now because we literally when we were running this we had we brought in a PA to work around the night and all that he did was when we got ready for the next shot click he sent off the next one because they didn't have batch and we needed to work on it the next day so it Nokia's doing a great job of listening Be, to before the there was auto stitcher there was auto clicker right they just yeah they just <laughs> his name was John <laughs> but Nokia's doing a great job of listening to the way people are using the camera and updating it and it's you know as production people it never goes as fast as we would like but it's uh, it's so wild to see how fast the technology is evolving just day by day Good question. That is a good question. Anything we do to save time and post next time? I have a script. <laughs> that, that would be nice, writer. <laughs> you had a script. We just threw it out the window when we started yeah, right. rolling. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it. I'm giving Andrew a hard time, but absolutely, it's it's having a solid plan from from the beginning. Um, we really shot this pretty conservatively. We didn't bring a lot of uh, the action really close to camera. We weren't moving the camera. Um, you know, the same week this launched, a piece that we did all the post on um, with missing pieces for the NBA Finals also launched where it was the exact opposite, where they were hand-holding the camera and running all over the place and we couldn't clean up anything. and. Um, and it had a lot of the same the same problems, um, the same I won't say problems difficulties. So it, planning is is big, but since we were conservative with this, I, I think that um, we actually did did ourselves a favor and saved a lot of the time in post. Yes. Um, I know that the Ozone has 360 sound. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah, so most of the sound in the final piece was actually from single source audio. So we, we recorded the spatial audio from the Ozo. Um, I, I think it's four track spatial. I'm looking at Chuck as if he's going to 
You want to wait? Yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then we everybody had a lav on who was speaking, um, and Luke had his handheld mic as he was walking around too. So in in post, say what? Always, yeah. It's the same as any other shoot. So we go back and post and clean it up as much as we can and work with more tools that are changing every day to spatialize and then you get to the rollout and you realize that there's like you know one platform that currently supports spatialized audio on playback and everything else gets a mono or stereo mix and you're done um, spatialized audio it the importance of audio in this to really put you in the place can't be overstated it's so important to have a good spatialized mix and thankfully um, I think a lot of the initial focus was on the visual capture and all of the audio guys went in guys and girls I don't mean to say they're just guys obviously 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 <laughs> um, all of the audio people are finally going hey we need to get our stuff right too so we're, we're seeing some really phenomenal um, progress in the last year in audio um, with you know ambisonics capture and uh, uh, HOA playback. Um, there's some awesome things in the MPEG-4 or MPEG-H format uh, decoding. Uh, Facebook bought some some of the tools and opened them up for free for people who want to mix with their surround console. So there are a lot of tools available now, and now we're just waiting to see where a standard nets out so that we can have a standard playback across all of the different platforms so that, you know, Goodness, wouldn't it be nice to mix it once and hear it that way across all of the different platforms? What do you think, Chuck? I think that's great. All I right. love audio. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. It's got to be for you, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of in your. It was really fun. We had a, you know, it was a, I think part of the the spirit of the company um, and the town. That was something that that, like I said earlier, we we took that seriously and wanted to kind of really make it, uh, you know, celebrate that little part of Detroit that we were looking at. Um, the most fun, I guess maybe just being up on the roof was pretty cool, and that football thing, mm -hmm. just throwing the football over uh, was, was kind of... Yeah, cool that was thing. fun. Oh, my God, yep. it took I, forever uh, to read that <laughs> shot. Do you remember? I, yeah, I feel yeah. Like Oh, my God. It's just a... <laughs> no. <laughs> well, and we, and we had to go uh, running all through the factory trying to find a football that wasn't going to uh, wasn't going to retail so that we could throw it off because we were all pretty sure that we were going to get one shot at that and then it was going to be uh, exploding on contact and that's it. <laughs> I think we got two takes and they found two yeah. footballs. Yeah. I feel like we were also, they also said we had like two more minutes. Yeah, well. We kicked off. Oh yes, oh. I forgot about that. Yeah, gorilla <laughs> filmmaking. It was really like yeah, improvised. Like oh, let's do this and let's do that. And it was that was great because it was very fresh. Like this is this is what we've got. Let's let's do whatever we want, you know. And it I don't know. I think my big surprise looking at the piece is that in VR, in live action VR, the it's always difficult with the acting. I don't know why. I acting for VR is maybe more akin to acting for theater than it is for uh, movies. And it's very difficult to, even with excellent actor, to, I don't know, to, to find this like sweet spot of acting. And I watched the Shinola, and it's not because I worked on it, but I was, I was amazed by the, the quality of the acting. It was, I thought it was, especially for a comedy. I mean, comedies is the most difficult thing when it comes to pacing and mm -hmm. acting. And, I think it was also because there was this guerrilla style run and gun, let's do thing, let's improvise shot and go with the flow, and we have this truth that comes through. Um, I think it's authentic. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think that's I think that's clear, and and um, 
Andrew and Luke, y'all were phenomenal to work with. I mean, your your laser focus on uh, on getting it in the can, getting the good takes, and um, getting as much as we could out of two really tight days of, of production with a uh, a new medium where you're you're going okay. They haven't told me which button I need to push to make this work again. Um, patience. We appreciate your patience. <laughs> um, do you have anything else to add for, for acting? You know, I think one of the reasons that it's so difficult to act for this medium is you don't have access to all of the tools in editorial. So we can't cut away to another shot and bring you right back right. If, if the timing isn't uh, dead on. What, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think there, there, the, those challenges exist. Uh, I mean, for this, for this piece, uh, you know, we, we kind of did the man on the street thing, so that's sort of a character, you know, kind of the jaunty, fast-talking, quip-filled guy, and that's, I think that's an easier kind of part to play. Uh, I mean, it wasn't, this wasn't Hamlet. <laughs> so, uh, you know. We'll, um, we'll try that next. Yeah, I mean, and, and yeah. then in, in terms of the pacing, I mean, I think it actually helped us, I think, to not, to have the restriction of having the camera movement limited to, the camera didn't move. Right. Um, so we had to make stuff happen, you know, uh, you know, right there. And I think that that, it limited the setups, and I think that maybe kind of helped the, you know, made things kind of go fast, made it, it kind of forced us to make, come up with things that would go faster. I think there were only, you know, even over two days and that huge number of hours of footage, I think there were only eight or nine setups. Yeah. Of which we used almost, you know, seven, almost all, all of, of them. So, um, I think, yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed the, the, the medium a lot. I, I, I want to, looking forward to, you know, using it again with a little more time to prep and plan, you know. Yeah, um, totally. Really fun for, for what we did. And also, you know, that the, the, you know, we're doing a factory tour and it's semi, you know, it's a little, you know, the, the what they're, they're kind of very small things that they're working on for the most part, watches and things, and that's not really conducive, really, I don't think, or at least the way we were conceiving of it. That's why we kind of came up or whoever had the idea for the box, the, the looking closely at the, at the watches and things being built and putting that inside. And that was a good idea, but ultimately I think it was, we were trying to kind of take the action a little bit away from the, from what was happening, put it on the people more. Um, again, kind of like what we're talking about yeah. with Detroit and try to make it sort of fun and, and uh, because of, you know, factory tours. Yeah, tough. and that came through I, it, when in the initial phase coming back to the, question you asked earlier about the motivation which I know they had this incredible story and, and part of the challenge was um, you know making there was a lot of people didn't realize that it was true you know that this is really happening up there so you know the idea of being able to um, look inside out you know f from the factory out from the people out and you know we threw out a bunch of other ideas things that we've talked to them about including profiles if you go to the website for Shinola probably the most powerful thing is their trailer that they have about their company and it's all about the people they're mm -hmm. little mini conversations with people that were that are now longtime employees and the transition that each of them made and and the one thing you'll see there um, is this enormous pride it just just bursts through the frame of them creating things that they know and the stamp that they do they, they it's a real it's a for them it's a it's an it's a really valuable thing to say here's this piece of metal with my initials my name stamped on it it really looks like a really you don't want to get rid of the box you don't want to get rid of the the, the little metal thing that's got their name on it it's it's this weird visceral thing so trying to get that out in the piece that was done I think was accomplished, and I think there's just a lot more that can happen. It's the humanity that comes through. So. Yeah. Totally. Yes. I think we had him, and then. Oh. Yeah. I haven't seen this piece. Yeah, absolutely. It's on YouTube or Facebook 360 or Shinola's website, or you can find it on Gear VR, or I can send you a link to get it on Oculus. Take your pick. Okay. <laughs>
we didn't. I thought we had we had Luke looking at the other people, right? Is that yeah? We didn't yeah. have to. We didn't have to no. think that, right? I think the the main thing is to understand that the VR camera is not a camera. It's a human being. I mean, it's weird, mm -hmm. but. When you look at the camera, it's literally the head of the viewer. When you have your headset on, you are, your two eyes are the two eyes of the camera. And I'm, I think where we're going at is the relationship between the actor and the camera is completely different than in cinema. Because it's a real person. You're not looking at a movie through a rectangle projecting onto, you know, onto a wall. It's all around you. So it would throw off the... Yep. We didn't have to change. No, they're actually yeah, really looking at each other, and it looks right in VR. Mm -hmm. But there was one particular camera he would have to look at uh, as if it was the audience eyes, right? It's, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. One, so there was that aspect. Yeah. Um, Nobody has to run away when you press the cord. <laughs> how did you handle the entire environment? And how did you pick the point of interest? Because when, when you first go to YouTube, I see something first. How do you handle that? And how did you think, I know I'm asking too many questions, but I have a lot of questions. Yeah. How did you think about the edit? Like, if they're if we're looking here instead of here, yeah. how, do, how did you pick, I'm going to cut to this and mm -hmm. still make it smooth? Yeah, those are all really good questions. I, I, we had a, a ton of help from Celine on, on all those kinds of geography questions. Um, we f f kind of found that when you when you put the headset on, you can you know just like in real life, your attention is directed to what you hear and what you see first. So if you ask me a question, my first instinct is to look at where the sound and where you know I don't I'm not tempted really to look behind me. Uh, or any place else, really. So we focused on Luke, really, the whole time. Um, we cleared out around, but I don't know. That, again, that's something where I feel like we didn't necessarily take full advantage of the technology. We did on a few shots, a couple of the setups, mm -hmm. but you know, of the nine setups that we had, six or five might have just been straightforward. You know, really, we, we cleared out around, but I, the, there, I don't think there's much chance of a person that has the headset on of turning away from Luke while he's doing his gag to see what's happening back there. They might, but I think the vast majority of people are just going to be focused just like you are in real life. Yeah. Uh, and, that... Yeah, and, and you know, for the question of, of editorial, we've, we've had the, um, uh, the fortune of doing a lot of content in 360. Um, we've finished several series and long form pieces and uh, highly polished spots and um, our editor Quan is is really spending a lot of time uh, trying new things and seeing what works. So you know, handed down wisdom in 360 was you can't cut. You know, the thought was a cut in 360 becomes a teleportation device instead of a temporal device, right? So what Quan said is, well, that's just not going to work. You can't tell a story if you can't cut. And he tried and tried and tried different things until he found that if, if you really hone in on the focus on where the viewer's looking, you know, when viewers first put on the headset, they're looking all over the place, but then they settle in and watch the story, and they're watching where the story's unfolding. And if you keep the focus so that people don't get lost through a cut, then people can watch a piece with a bunch of edits and, and it's not disorienting. Um, you still have to be a little more uh, selective of when you choose to cut, but it's, it, there's a whole new language, you know. It, the language of filmmaking really it has to evolve for this. It's, it's a different medium. Yeah, um, I don't think we, we, we use sort of very simplistic techniques. Right. We say, okay, we're finished here in the tech room. Let's follow me over to the, to the prep room, and then we'd be in another shot. Right. That's, you know, rudimentary, obviously, and awkward. I mean, it works for this, but I, I can see the, you know, just what you're saying. There's right. going to be a whole new 
sort of language of, of ways to make things yep. and cutting things. And it's got to be written through experimentation. Right. You know, it, Celine's point about the camera being the viewer's head is, is one of the most important things you can keep in mind while you're filming. Um, you know, you go in and, and you put a camera low and it, you're, not, you're not placing a camera low and making somebody look like they're, you know, towering and powerful walking into the frame. You're all of a sudden making the viewer feel like they're an ant. You set the camera high, you're not looking down on people, you're making the viewer feel like they're a giant. It's you've got to always be conscious of the viewer and what their experience is as you're putting the piece together. It's a, it's a different way to work, but it's, it's very, very powerful if you get it right. Um, you know, what, what that lends us to is when we, when we go show this to people, um, when we show people VR content, the more immersive, the better. They, they come out of the experience not talking about what they watched. They don't talk about saying, you know, oh, that was a cool thing I saw on that screen. They talk about what they did, what they experienced, what their emotions were. It's a totally different connection to the audience. And I, I think that's where the power is. And that's why it's so important um, as, as filmmakers to, uh, to have a responsibility for what you're putting out. Yeah, um, I'm, I want to show a, sm a quick example of the actual film, and I apologize because this is YouTube, and I'm using a s Surface, so it might not be... We'll see if it plays, but... <laughs> All right, not real time, but I'll give you an idea. Why don't we have sound? All right, so there is no sound for some reason. So he says, hey, look over there. <laughs> so we turn, we discover the city. So that's, that's the typical uh, technique that we use with tracking the POI, the point of interest. So in this case, Luke is the obvious POI. He's moving, he's a human being, he's moving, he's talking to us, we wanna watch him, and he's funny. So he goes out, out of the frame, I mean, a, away from, from us, and we cut, and he will come back from the exact same spot in the sphere. So it's very easy for us to track it back into the next shot. Yeah, let's keep, I'm gonna answer your question right after. I just wanna keep going a little bit. So every time we cut, Luke is at the exact same position in the sphere. So even though it's completely different location, and yes, the people want to look around, it's actually pretty easy to follow the story. And there is, it's a three minute piece. There is about 18, 19 shots, which is a lot for VR. One of those shots is only six seconds long. And the reason why it works, it's again because we use this technique and the six second long shot is the location we've been before. It's a shot that, it's a running joke, so we always come back to the same setting, and because people know the setting, know the shot, they won't like look around them, they know, so we, that we can allow ourselves to do very short, like six second. And I think they did a brilliant job with the editing, I wasn't part of it, but <laughs> it's, it's completely different than everything I've done before. Usually we stay on the shot for at least 15 seconds before we cut to the next one. That was the first time I was seeing such a short edit in VR without being disturbing. How do you position the camera, you say, when, when he walks away? Are you measuring literally how far he was away when you, on the next take you try? I mean, no, it's just the position in the sphere, so it doesn't matter if he's far or close. It, it, it works great for that specific shot because he comes from the distance, but we didn't, no, we didn't measure any of that. Yes? So that specific shot was on the rooftop, so it was GoPro rig, which was 3D all around. And it's a very good question. We, when we were shooting the Ozo, we actually shot plates. Like we rotate the camera on the nodal-ish to shoot 3D behind the camera and try to put the two together. But I don't think that was actually used in post-production. I don't think it's full 3D. I think we kept the original Ozo file 
And for the rest of the shot, he usually looks, stays in this zone, the 3D zone in front of the camera, I think. Yes, you're correct. Yes. Budgeting, Chuck. We cannot uh, verify or deny that there is any budget <laughs> on this film. Uh, you know, it, it, because it is a client project, we can't get in the details of the budget. But you know, the idea was to be super efficient um, in the overall process. It wasn't a massive budget, um, and with the kind of the creative uh, liberties that we. Uh, by throwing out the script and letting us pick the shots up and and that I think there, it's all about horse trading in production is is you just find the footage find the idea and uh, it comes out in the wash so on um, the um, what was the other question budget Throwing. the team putting uh, the team together so it that's a that's a good question so we we have most of the team full-time on staff at Real Effects. You know, we've got the, uh, all of the post team is, is the same across all of the projects. Um, Celine came very, very highly recommended to us. Um, since we were using the Ozo for the first time, it was really important to us uh, to have people that had shot with that system before, um, which was an incredibly small pool when we shot with it. Um, you actually may know better, but uh, somebody had told me that we were one of the first productions to shoot with that camera without oh, wow. Nokia's direct supervision. Do you know? No, I didn't know that. Because I know you did a lot of the testing with Nokia. Yeah, my very first VR film was the prototype of the Ozo. I was actually hired directly by Nokia to shoot with the prototype. So I didn't know that, though. That's yeah. interesting. But just funny story, two days, maybe three days before the shoot, so... The, I got the job, which was because I'm also one of the few people who still know how to shoot in native 3D, and because we, we had this macro shot that we didn't use. <laughs> so I was on board as the stereographer and the shooter for the macro shot. So I went to Radiant, which was a rental house for the 3D. I prepared, prepared the rig, and, and I was in my car driving back home. I got a call from Steve, the producer, and we started talking, and I started it's like, wait a minute, is there a misunderstanding? I'm your stereographer. I was like, no, you're the DP. So I didn't even know I was the DP of the movie two days before the shoot. <laughs> it came together pretty quick. Um, and then on, on bringing in Luke and Andrew, uh, we it really came from the Satellite Beach short. That was kind of that the persona that um, that we were looking for for the piece. Um, and uh, it, it's not the exact same character, but it kind of has that same uh, same style. Um, do you want to talk about? Yeah, that's a short that uh, Luke and I made a couple years ago. Uh, it's 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 a long short, like 30 minutes long. But it, it, it Luke plays a character who's obsessed with the uh, move of the space shuttle from LAX to the California Science Center after the shuttle's been decommissioned. He sort of thinks that he's in charge of the move, uh, and then we find out halfway through that he's, that he's insane. Uh, but it's it's kind of a funny, weird piece. But it, it did really, you know, we, it it won the Santa Barbara Film Festival Best Short, so it's done it's it's done really well. And people, it's it's um, I guess it got us this job. Yeah. So can't got to be good then. Yeah. Weird, good weird. <laughs> And in, in general, when it comes to VR, a lot of people ask me, how big is the crew? And I mean, obviously, with shooting in VR, you have to hide the crew. So that's a big aspect of, you don't want 10,000 people waiting around on Apple boxes, because you're going to have to hide those people or shoot plates. So usually, camera-wise, uh, the crew is pretty small, mostly also because we, in very rare occasion, actually use lights and light the shots. It's great when we shoot the technique that's called quadrants. That means we shoot only a portion of the sphere at the same time. So then we can really light like a traditional movie. And then we can have a full crew. Uh, when we shoot the entire sphere at once, um, usually there is a camera. Yeah, I mean, a DP, a guy.
you're in the store? I'm in the s I'm somewhere. Yeah. Maybe it's later. Yeah, I've got a we we were shooting. Yeah, I think it's in the, another take, but if you look behind, which hopefully nobody will do, I'm <laughs> right there pretending to be a client in the shop and that was the yeah. only way I could keep an eye on, on things. Yeah, one one of the previous projects that we had done was for Hilton in Barbados. Uh, we were shooting last January. And uh, it doesn't matter so much to you who live here in L.A., but for uh, anybody on the East Coast or around, if you get the chance to shoot in Barbados in January, I highly recommend you take it. Um, but we, w the Ozo wasn't available yet. It didn't exist when we were, when we were shooting. It wasn't available. It did exist. You were shooting with yeah. it. <laughs> but um, we had a standard GoPro rig, and so the way you, you have your director and your agency client and your client and everybody who needs to see the action in, in the scene is you put them in the scene. So you say, okay, you're in that hammock, you're leaning on that palm tree, all right, just look natural. My uh, four-month-old daughter was in the shot, so it was a lot of fun. Oh man, I should have. <laughs> and get some royalties and all. Dude, yeah. you should be my agent. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> cool. That is an interesting question. Yes. So, what contract was Luke on then? He's the spokesperson for this thing. It's actually like a. Is it a commercial? I guess? I don't actually know the answer. I don't know. Neither do I. All right. <laughs> We'll get back to you on that. <laughs> there has to be some kind of yeah. SAG yeah. arrangement. Yeah. Yep. Thankfully, we have a much, much smarter people than me at the studio who uh, get to handle all of that stuff. We'd bring our business affairs guy, but that would have just pulled the whole panel down. <laughs> <laughs> Trevor's lovely. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think we probably have time for one more question. Yeah. All right. What did we use for stitching? We used Nokia Creator, Beta of Cara VR, Nuke, Flame, After Effects. We did the edit in Premiere and uh, toyed with Avid for some of it. And Sorry. Every Spatial audio. Every tool in the book. APV, have you ever used that one? Is that good? APV? Yeah, auto, yes, we use that all the time. Yeah, that and Giga. Yep. That all goes back to the very important transmodal aspect of, of VR. I mean, yep. crossing platforms for distribution, crossing platforms, I mean, making it work, you know, having in every single project I work on, we use uh, at least two or three different software just for the stitching process. One for just stitching, the other one to hide the tripod or whatever, another one to yep. hand paint this, you know. Yep. And you don't want to. Uh, bogged down a flame suite doing stitching, but sometimes that it, for the paintwork especially, that's the it's the best place to do it. Lean into all the tools you've got. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Appreciate right. it. Thank you, guys.